on the ball. Cześć. Sucks. Hello, thank you very much. Okay, you know my name by now, you know where I come from, and other than that, I'm not only Okado, but I also work for AGH University of Science and Technology, SWPS, where I work with data use. I'm a very particular UX because I'm a data UX. What does that mean? That, for example, means that sometimes at night you wake with an existential question and you want to know how much data is generated by a cucumber. We sometimes laugh that Okado is really a greengrocer and, well, this is green. So that's a green veggie that generates on average 76,000 events. Events that happen from the moment when the uh, cucumber was bought to the moment when it reaches the end question and to compare uh, an Airbus 300 generates 1.5 thousand events. Okay, so how come that in a, at a green grocers this generates 76 thousand events? This is a fully automated uh, green grocers. We create a technology for retailers, that's those who sell. We help them build highly automated warehouses and then ship everything, make sure that logistics works, but also move their business to online, to the internet. The heart are our warehouses and the blood circulation are the bots that move around the grid. And as you see, every day they generate plenty of data. If we bring together all those systems, bots, but also people cooperating with them, other automated solutions that we have, the total in our data lake is 3.3 billion events with 2.6 thousand terabyte data. To imagine how much that is, if we say that one event is one centimeter, it's a physical, we, we make them physical, we would uh, circumnavigate the Earth five times, and the volume of data is more or less tantamount to 285 years of watching Netflix end to end. So, quite a long binge watch, isn't it? Well, will that tell you anything? Is that useful for you at all? No. I probably got that wow thing, yeah, they've got plenty of data, don't they? But precisely, what to do about it? Where to go from here? Well, if we wanted to define some things around us, data is everything that we can process. That's data. You see here all the information on the monitor, but does that tell us anything? Can we in any way use that data? Probably not yet. It could be better if we had information. Information is data that was set in a specific reality, and we know what reality that is. We have the context, we know what was put into it, and we know what it's all about. When we add context, we see that these are two ways of describing a cucumber traveling through our warehouses and through all that system. How do we know it's uh, cucumber? Oh, because we have the same ID in both of the tables. That's the key that lets us bring the two uh, tables together. Let's ask another question. Why do we need the data? Why do we uh, keep three billion events, more than 200 years of watching events in one place? What for? Well, we need two things of a higher level. First, we can provide better answers to business questions. Examples? Well, do the changes that we introduced in the systems improved things, or perhaps they disimproved things? Maybe we reduced the uh, time to client, or perhaps now the supply time is longer, or what was the baseline for uh, supply time? Is it now extended or shortened? Without information, we can say, ah, we feel we've done it. If we have data, we can say, yes, we did it, we went the proper way. 
And we can answer that business question. Another high level reason why we collect data is making more conscious decisions. Let's say we've changed the way how bots move on the grid. We know that in this way they can collect the orders more quickly and they make it more quickly to the clients. Now a question and a decision to be taken whether we want to take it to all the other warehouses. If we don't have data, we'll be guessing, will it work or not? With data we can think, okay, what are the differences between our uh, warehouse and others, or will it all do a big bang and it's gone? But, you know, bots collect things faster, but we may have a uh, tinge somewhere else and problems will arise. We provide answers, we make decisions and everything goes uh, cool and fast, but what happens if we misunderstand the data or if the data mislead us. And now, let's take out one item delivered. It was in one of the tables that you've seen. We see the date and we see the time. What happens if delivered means that it physically reached the client, the client collected it, and what if it means that somebody who prepared the application and the application sends data to data lake said no. That would mean that when the driver of the van put his terminal into the scanner and copied all the data into the database. We've got two different realities and we can answer that question and this may positively generate a problem in the future, because we understood it differently. Now, what do we need this data for? What does it say about the world? This beautiful data lake, as we call large collections in the data world, very quickly turns into a quagmire of that time. A data swamp. Where does it end? Well, how about that? Anaconda producing software for machine data processing, they're quite good in the market, ran a questionnaire among their users and they realized that around 66% of the respondents believe that they still spend fairly long time not on answering data uh, and business questions, on improving their decision-making skills, but they spend most time on finding, understanding, cleaning and processing data. So this is Pareto principle on the head, 66% of effort on a bit more than 30% of the work that you get at the end. Well, if we have such data, we know that it's not bad, not terrible. We looked at it at Ocado and we know that things can still be done and that we can still work on it. Now, where to start? Let's start with people, the people who work with the data. Let's learn things about the data. What you see here is a mind map that we call a data tree that was built at the initial stage of understanding what we're up to, what we need to bite into, where to start, things like those. First, there's quite a lot of it. Second, it's highly technical. You get words like data story, data object, derived object, data feed, and all those terms that are very popular in the UX world. Cool. That's really a good, cool thing for a poor UX like me. Where to start? We can just lock ourselves for three years, we closing business and we learning. Okay, but where to get money for it if business doesn't operate? We need to fish things out from that. And that was precisely when we invited people, people working with data on both ends, who create it, who cherish it, who use it in the daily practice, we sat together and began to consider how to bite into it so that all these things worked the way they should. And that's why we decided that this is an 
extensive subject. We must build uh, an environment for work which will be efficient, that we will have one language, function together, learn from one another. So we created certain pillars that help us function, operate in it. First, we don't focus on features, we don't jump into conclusions, we don't say, okay, we'll be doing objects faster, we'll do it, that's going to be cool. No, if we don't look through people in needs, we won't know. Another subject. This is a huge subject things are interconnected, we've got to understand that yes, there is some kind of solution, we nearly there, but everything then crumbles cookie-wise because there are three or four more factors. We will never fall in love in solutions, we either build some things on what we've already done or we'll have to blow some solutions up take two steps back and see what we fail to understand what we lost. Uh, of course, diversified and closely cooperating team, a buzzword in the UX world. We had to turn it into something that's really operational. Everyone who participates in development of that project in testing where the problems lie, have the same right to vote. They can say, this is my idea, perhaps that's not really okay, see how things work and say, okay, how about putting our heads together, because this may have a reason, and including users into the process from the start. They work on it, they will be able to explain things to us, things that we may not necessarily understand. Now, for all that to function, and so that we are never lost among that, we need to put on top of that a simple process. I love the IBM loop from IBM Design Thinking, which is broken into three fairly easy and self-explanatory sections, observe, reflect, and make. Okay. All right. We thought, damn, we don't know what it looks like, let's start from observation. Let's try to understand it all even better and even more in-depth. When I tested, on average, we had 34 people at the start. They were UXs, they were data engineers, software engineers, they were data analysts, and all the joyful gang of people observing, watching the process. We wanted to talk to them during surveys, interviews, questionnaires, to gain as much information as possible and to learn the language that they use in their daily work so that everything works fine. Then we broke it to cluster them and we, we broke them into two major groups. Data producers, that's the first one, and data consumers, that's the other group. There's other group, mostly data analysts and data scientists. We listed their main needs and then we considered Either we bite into it in two ways and we build two parts, or perhaps we'll find a common denominator and we'll run it along one path, one main need that's really universal. They all want to find and understand the data, which they will then work and process in various ways. Okay, what was it? When they were searching, they ran into many places. Data collections, ask other people, perhaps they work somewhere, maybe there is some tribal knowledge. In Okado technology, everything is around Slack, why not ask at Slack? Perhaps we'll get some uh, information, some intel. Then the second step, what can I understand from the data? What does it mean if its data is delivered? Does it mean that you collected it or was the data delivered to a disk? And that understanding happened in other places. You needed to bring together incomplete data, find who produced it, ask the data producers, look into tribal knowledge, and tribal 
were some talks, some spreadsheets, but also some post-it notes that people had on their monitor. You know, sharing post-it notes is a very effective process, as you know, and so forth and so forth. Okay, so here we go. We have two separate processes, meaning that everything lasts longer from the moment you find data until you use data. That takes a lot of time. So we thought that maybe we could shorten that period of time. And that's uh, what we did. We sat down, we started reflecting on it, and here's the northern star. That's the direction we want to follow. This is what should be helpful, what should help people first find and then understand data. Okay, so in the world of data, that's what we call data catalogs. But now, all right, we, want, we know what we want to do, we know how to name it, but how do we do it? So, what's the origin of Sherlock? Sherlock is the logo that I proudly wear on my t-shirt. Usually, if you work for a large organization, then there are three ways of delivering new solutions. The first one is that you take something that you already have, usually an organization that has been in operation for a number of years, has collected several solutions. Maybe you can connect the dots and maybe this is going to work. The second solution is quite easy. You have some money, you go out into the market, you select an available solution, you buy it off the shelf, and then you apply it. The third solution is about, you know, sitting at a desk and creating a new solution from scratch. And that's uh, an interesting solution, a nice approach, because it allows you to learn even more. First, you can understand your organization better, because, you know, as you sit down, noses to the grindstone, you cannot immediately decide that you select the first, the second, or the third solution from the point of view of UX design. You will have to validate the solutions in terms of which one is the best, the most optimum, in terms of how it helps solve your clients' uh, problems, as well as in terms of the budget that you need to allocate for it. And so as you search through the existing solutions, you will understand how things work in your company even better, how you can connect the dots. Maybe you will find some solutions that are dispersed and actually cause more problems. If you validate the existing solutions on the market, you learn about how others do it, what others have done, what mistakes they have made, and if possible, if you can carry out a proof of concept at your company, you will cooperate with implementation teams, and implementation teams are really involved, they know how to code. You can also check things out from the point of view of UX design, and it will have a, a very good impact on teamwork. And the third solution is, of course, the one that, uh, that gives you uh, the most fun, because you have to build something from scratch. So this is a, an example. You will see the knowledge on the existing solutions, the proof of concept that we've carried out, then users could try it out for over a month. We asked users to fill in a diary study so they would inform us on what's okay, what works, what is not working, what is helpful, what has not been helpful, whether we have helped them um, solve their problems or not. And step by step, we learned more about what we could offer to them. Okada has a very specific architecture. There are 12 retailers, and every retailer needs their own data um, tables, and they cannot mix because otherwise we would infringe on the um, competition uh, uh, provisions. And, you know, retailers should not be in the know as to how things work for other retailers, so every object has to be multiplied at least 12 times, and instead of a single data table where we could have everything, we need to come up with 12 separate data objects, data tables. Data catalogs uh, are usually prepared for companies that store it in a single place, so it wasn't a solution for us. It was quite problematic for our end users as well, so we decided that we had to come up with something new. We decided to come up with a Sherlock data catalog. Sherlock is uh, 
what we think of as a super consumer, as an uber consumer of data. Why is that so? Well, Sherlock is not just a search engine. I will show you the EY to you in a minute. But let's say that you search for an order, you type it in. What does Sherlock do in the background? Well, in the background, you know, Sherlock runs around different places where data is stored, checking whether there might be some new meta metadata that's indexed. And Sherlock, in fact, uh, collects all the data in the background and the end user does not have to do it on their own. So the user receives everything in one place. The path is much quicker for the end user to take a look at what data they're dealing with. And if you think of our users, here's some feedback. I would like to quote two opinions. Prior to Sherlock, I had to ask all around the business to find data I needed, hoping that someone would know a table I could use. Another opinion is Sherlock, in general, is a game-changing product. In the left uh, upper corner, you might have noticed a, uh, a magnifying glass, a loop, sorry. And in fact, in a month's uh, time, Sherlock will be celebrating its first uh, birthday, and Sherlock has been developing continuously, and in order for it to develop us as a team working on Sherlock, we also need to have access to data, to information that is passed on to us by the end users. So we are sort of working in the loop as well. With, uh, with a view to understanding more about how the process works. And so we now have more information on the users. And apart from the standard discovery that we uh, run, we also have web analytics. We also have moderated and non-moderated tests of all the um, functionalities at the usability hub. We have the on-site feedback. And those opinions that I quoted come from the on-site feedback. So, in fact, you, everyone can click on the um, Get Feedback uh, button, and you will have access to the on-site feedback. This is an internal instrument that usually 200 people use on average. But what we managed to do is come up with uh, an on-site feedback uh, functionality that's uh, more attractive for, 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 for customers. So clients tell us about processes that could be taken better care of. They are in uh, a more regular contact with us. Sherlock has become really a, uh, a driver behind tighter communication between us and the clients. So what we say is, here's a functionality that we've delivered thanks to your feedback, dear clients, dear customers. We have improved this and that thanks to your feedback, thanks to the fact that you have uh, indicated it to us that it, that it wasn't perfect. If something worked but it was not ideal, you would point it out to us, so it's thanks to you that we've improved on it. So, you know, feedback is not, does not end up somewhere in the void but keeps circulating and we act on it. Okada Technology Links uh, team, this is uh, our team behind Sherlock, this is our implementation team, and there's my own team that is UX uh, team. So the, the feedback loop would not have been possible without our internal teamwork. So the buzzword is UX designers work with um, uh, product people, and often that leads to interesting effects. Well, there's no sound in the movie, but here's an example. Today I'm in the office, natural environment of LinkedIn. Those are guys who create Sherlock application. So these are our developers. They have uh, filmed a movie on different Sherlock uh, features. They would show it in the movie how they work hard and sweat over new Sherlock functionalities. 
And um, a lot of people at Alcado has uh, copied it, 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 so now they start advertising their uh, services with the use of such short uh, video clips. So it's an internal tool, really. It's a, an instrument for internal communication, but when advertised, it becomes adopted quickly amongst the end uh, users. So it has almost become a viral movie and people are interested in it and uh, it, it, it becomes a part of the internal uh, company Slack. So this is an example. It's a feature that's uh, a bit like sharing post-it notes because users told us at some point, well, there's a lot of tribal knowledge. It's not efficient to share tribal knowledge the way we used to do it. So Sherlock could be a crowdsource where we can share knowledge, where we can share our problems, where we can discuss our projects that are based on data, and we can later show it to other people. And we said, okay, fine, why not? So we've um, carried out the proof of concept. Some things work well, others not so much. For instance, when reporting mistakes, when reporting errors, we found out that it would require a, a, a larger project to be carried out, so that's outside of our scope for now, and uh, in a while this uh, feature will be available to, uh, to our uh, end customers, and we'll see how it works in reality. But as I said, it's good to speak one language, it's good to have a single language that helps you restructure the app. So in our case, in the world of data, the language used to be thinking about data as a product, not thinking about data as uh, tables, as uh, titles, as items, but as products. Okay, so, you know, going back to Kagan and his inspired uh, book, what he said was uh, that there are three pillars, that data need to be feasible, valuable, usable. So that's what we decided to apply. Ms. Delgani, author of Data Mesh, and I highly recommend the book to you, described eight attributes of data as a product. So data need to be discoverable, they need to be understandable, they need to be addressable, you need to know what the data address is so that you can find them just like you find a website using your search engine. They need to be trustworthy, they need to be natively accessible, they also need to be, they should be interoperable. I'd like to go back to the ID example from the beginning of my presentation. You need to be able to link different data with one another so as to retrieve more information. So they should be interoperable, they should be valuable on their own. So you take the data and some value should be attached to it. Let's say that there's a table with uh, the quantity of a product purchased and separately, separately there's a table with information on the different items, I don't know, such as, you know, kilos or liters. So these two separate tables do not come with an added value because you will not be able to draw some uh, significant conclusions that will be difficult to you to work with two separate tables. You need to know what the unit is and then what the quantity is, and that should be placed within the same table. Uh, producers of Guarantee Auto has, have, have, have uh, experienced a data a breach, so data needs to be secure as well. Data needs to be secure. If it's sensitive data related to employees, related to customers, then not everyone should have access to such data. Not everyone should be able to, to view such data. Now, here's a nice quote as well. If you think of data as a, as a product, here's a quote that testifies to how uh, data have two most important characteristics, namely two most important characteristics of good design are discoverability and understanding. And that's a quote from Don Norman and his book, The Design of Everyday Things. So that was the basis for the creation of Sherlock. You can find some descriptions uh, uploaded from another source that's marked in yellow. And 
you will find these lovely tables that help you understand what sort of data you're dealing with and then justifying two tables with one another, you will see an ID, a key sort of to the data that's in front of you. And so you can nicely link data with one another. You will see also the data. Um, addresses, you can pass on the data, you can also use the data in an application that can be downloaded and then used further. But for data to be trustworthy, that's more complicated. For data to be trustworthy, you need to take into consideration a number of aspects. So what we did was to create an internal score, and we can describe how trustworthy the data are. So for instance, in this case, you can see that the score is 75%. That's less than 80%. Less than 80% of fields have description, so there may be some problems pertaining to the understanding of the data. These graphs are referred to as lineage. What lineage describes is where the data has come from, what happened along the way, and where the data moved. And so you can see the main object in the middle, and data consumers really pay attention to the left-hand side, so what's the origin of data, where the data has come from, but data producers, so the ones responsible for the object containing the data, mostly focus on the right-hand side, so who uses my data, because I need, to be, I need to be aware of whom to inform if something's wrong with the data, and if I have improved the data, then I need to know who to address. Or if the object is ready to be removed from the data lake and I want to inform other users about it, then I also need to focus on the right-hand side of that slide. And finally, safety. Who has access to data and how data may be used? Data governance loves this tab. But as I've said, Sherlock is a super consumer so to say. Sherlock also consumes data. So what we understood very quickly was that Sherlock on its own will not be able to work and this is not going to be an optimal solution. Sherlock needs a partner. You might have read those uh, books on Sherlock Holmes, there was Mrs. Hudson in it as well, and Mrs. Hudson is Sherlock's partner. So, you know, if there's a lot of mess, then you need to apply the garbage in, garbage out solution. So if there's description that's uh, fallacious, then Sherlock will upload the data, but it will not be correct. And so Mrs. Hudson is a project that we've been working on recently because Mrs. Hudson is about taking is, is all about taking care of whether descriptions are understandable, trustworthy, whether they comply with uh, the requirements of the end users. What we've uh, discovered was that we can actually apply our own solution. Eat your own dog food is what it's uh, called in English. Eat your own dog food. So you can tell the end user that, you know, they, they can find the data and um, understand them on their own. And uh, this is what we tried to do, because our implementation team actually failed at understanding a chunk of data because the data came with the strange descriptions and we had to approach the producers and we actually had to we had to um, uh, well inquire about the data so that's what we did Finally, two more things at the end. This is going to be the take-home message. And if you only remember this from my presentation, I will be happy nonetheless. It doesn't matter whether you are about to create an e-commerce solution that 3 million people will apply, or maybe just an internal software like us that only 200 employees will use at the end of the day. But you work with people, try to make sure that you work with people who will benefit from it, to take their needs into consideration. I know that this is a cliche, but I feel it has to be repeated time and again. If you don't know where to start, the internet is full of ideas. I've just talked about one. Uh, so try to use these ideas and then 
you need to adjust them to your needs. And please remember that these different processes are tools, and if the tool is not helpful, maybe do away with it and come up with a new one, or try to adjust the process better to your needs. It's better to adjust a tool that you've uh, been using to your own needs rather than apply uh, you know, a rubber hammer to cut out huge chunks of stone. So adjust the tools to your needs, you will see that the, if the outcomes are surprising. Sometimes, for instance, uh, developers start shooting movies. Another thing is, if you want to be data-oriented, if you want to be a data-oriented or a data-informed company that knows how to use data, well, you know, it's nice to come out to people, talk about different solutions, but it's also good to show that us as designers take care of data that we produce. Us UX designers take care of uh, data description so that others can use it easily. If we apply web analytics, uh, web, what well, that events should be described um, appropriately. Data is like a library. You can take different things out. But if you don't take care of your library, you will have lots of books, and every book will have a white cover with no title, no description. If you want to understand anything out of it, if you want to make anything out of it, you will have to walk around, take a book, read through it, check it out whether it's uh, helpful or not, and it will take a lot of time. And you know it very well that if you start taking care of describing events well, then instead of uh, searching for an hour, uh, you will spend a few minutes on it only. So that saves time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You have introduced us into the world of data. But I suppose that the world of data is so profound that there may be some questions from the audience. Do you have any questions? Would you like us to elaborate on the world of data presented? Anastasia, I'm going to ask you for help because I'm a little dazzled by the lights. So if there are any questions, please raise your hands. Are there any? Have you managed, with reference to Slack and the yellow post-it notes, have you managed to catalog them and use in Sherlock? Thanks for the question. Yes, on the one hand, it's about crowdsourcing of knowledge. On the other hand, Sherlock also has links to Slack, so it moves uh, data to specific places. If you're searching for a data producer, for instance, if you're searching for a team that's behind an application, you will be linked to them and you will be easily connected with them. So, so yes, it's, uh, it's working, even though, honestly speaking, we would like it not to happen outside of the context of data. Hence, the project oriented on collecting tribal knowledge. Because, you know, it's just as if uh, you would go to a store and take a product off the shelf, and then you find out that this is a product that you can use in five different ways, and only three years later, someone informs you that this is actually a product that you can use in this or that way. So we want this knowledge to be um, to be with you earlier, at an earlier stage. Thank you. Any any other questions I can see? No questions here, uh, but there are online questions. What was your work on Sherlock in the context of uh, the regular daily operational activities, and how many users uh, does Sherlock have? 200 people, as I said, 200 users as of now, so quite a large chunk of our market, because we've carried out an internal um, an internal market research. We thought of how many designated users there would be. Uh, so 200 is quite a lot. And speaking of our regular daily activities, you know, the UX uh, team was about to, to complete another project. So in fact, we did have a lot of time on our hands and we could allocate more time to Sherlock. That was... Uh, 
uh, very important for us. As I work for a department that deals with data, then, you know, everything that's associated with uh, data collection, well, Sherlock was important for us as well. It was one of the priorities. And as we've already delivered it, then Sherlock is only, you know, one of the projects, and, and then you have to know how um, how to prioritize your, your actions, your activities. So it's, it's just a typical element of UX, the design work. Certain, fortunately, Asha has been helping me a lot, our local manager. If data has a low score, will Sherlock automatically separate them? No, not yet. We're wondering whether Sherlock could work as a cleansing device. You know, if you, we see data with a low score and the data, let's say, has not been updated for three years, then maybe we should quarantine such data and inform data producers that, hey, maybe you should do away with the data because no one has been using it for three years, nothing has happened, we can see it in the lineage, let's do away with the data. So we've, um, you know, we've, we've done the proof of concept, uh, I think, a year ago, we had a presentation on digital waste, on all the digital waste that we that we produce. Removing a small chunk of data actually helps you make a lot of savings, a lot of savings uh, in terms of real money. So, so people are usually encouraged to do it. What business goals do you have now ahead of you? Well, as I said, Mrs. Hudson is now our business goal, and a large business goal for us is that data should be described appropriately so that we have no time, no problem, sorry, with, uh, you know, the, the eat-your-own-dog food um, thing. So we want data to be described in a reliable manner so that it's a product that we can be proud of, so that it's a product that may be put to use by others. Are there any further questions from the audience? I can see no further questions, so thank you, Martin. Thanks a lot for this introductory speech. We now know a little more about data. Thank you, and you're invited to visit our exhibition stand, Ocado. Just uh, next uh, to me, actually, there's a free desk, there's a vacancy, so if you're interested in, um, in data processing, you're invited to apply for the position. Thank you. Thanks.